movie watchers to the cinema shame podcast my name is james patrick but you can call me jay since you're into that whole brevity thing i'd like to remind everyone listening that cinema shame posts a monthly watch prompt at cinemashame.wordpress.com this month we're not so much giving you a new prompt as we are cracking that web to get the last movies on your shame statement watched before the end of the, 2019 it's increasingly evident that i'm once again not going to watch henry portrait of a serial killer before the end of the year uh, Brian, do you have any of those that you refuse to watch? Quite a um, little of Henry, the portrait, of the portrait of a serial killer. Well, I have seen that one time, and I'm not planning to watch it again. So that's, I uh, kind of am in that camp with you. That counts. I've had it on my <laughs> list for the last four years, and I just, I just <laughs> never, I never do it. It doesn't also seem like the movie you want to throw on during the holidays. I think that's probably why I put it off and put it off and put it off, and then I don't know. I've got Christmas Vacation to watch. I can't be bothered with. Um, did you know, this is just a total aside, but literally before we were getting on the call here, for some reason, oh, I saw somebody on Letterboxd logged Christmas Vacation 2, Eddie's Island. Have you seen this? No. <laughs> I had no idea this even existed. I didn't, I had no idea this was a thing. Okay, well, it looks pretty terrible, so I don't think you need to squeeze it in before the end of 2019, but... Never, never have... say never. <laughs> is... I'm just intrigued that it exists, so... Uh, is anyone actually in the movie? I mean, uh, Randy Quaid's in the movie. Beyond that, I'm not sure about... I, I mean, I mean, that's I know really she... all that we needed, I guess, if you're talking about Eddie's. But I mean, boy, I thought he was... What? What is this? What year? I'm so confused. What year is this movie? Um, That's a good question. <laughs> I got to look it up now because I just had it up. Oh, here it is. 2003. Is when there it... was a 2003 sort of sequel to Christmas Vacation that we're just now discovering. Yeah. National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation 2, Cousin Eddie's island adventure is the full title of the film um and yeah it looks like they i don't know i i think they brought back a couple other cast members like his wife miriam flynn is in it and dana Barron is in it um so yeah i don't know but the wow. ratings are pretty low <laughs> but i'm nonetheless intrigued because i didn't know it was a thing so i feel like this is a challenge actually this is a, yeah it's not so much a threat as a challenge i think so too I think we need to squeeze that one in, maybe. <laughs> that'll be our next. That'll be our next cinema shame podcast. <laughs> it's definitely a shameful thing I haven't seen. Not that we've never heard of it. Yeah. Somebody out there, yes, I'm sir. sure it's their favorite movie because everybody. Yep. Every movie is somebody's favorite movie. <laughs> exactly. Anyway. Forget that first Christmas vacation. Eddie's Island <laughs> Adventure is the way to go. It's it's like a it's like the ones that pick Caddyshack 2 over Caddyshack and don't get me wrong I really I do enjoy Caddyshack 2 but... me too honestly I'm, a, I'm actually a huge Caddyshack 2 defender but I'm never gonna say it's no. better than the Caddyshack that's insanity <laughs> anyway uh, I think we're both having a very good day uh, yes yeah my guest today in case you haven't read the title or recognized his voice is the host of the pure cinema podcast and the Just This podcast, he also runs a website called Rupert Pupkin Speaks, where guest bloggers share their favorite underrated films and discovery. I'm, of course, speaking of the great and powerful tastemaker, Brian Sauer. <laughs> you flatter me, sir. Like, but take, uh, also... The tastemaker part? I thought that was pretty good. That is nice. <laughs> um, but also thank you for years, literally years of contributions to Rupert Pupkin Speaks. Yeah, we are I, greatly I appreciate was looking it. at that because this is also relevant to our movie today. It is. Uh, Brian stopped by the Shame Quarters today to discuss a movie that I wrote about for your website, uh, 2013. It was actually the very first movie I recommended on your website. Yeah, and so thus has been in my head for, you know, six years, and I finally got around to it, and I'm so glad I did. Yep, and, and you're here to tell everyone about how you finally got around to watching Joe Pitka's Let It Ride from that transcendent year of cinema, 1989. I think uh, I speak for everyone in the free world when I say that it's about goddamn time. <laughs> it is about goddamn time. Excuse me, I'm taking a survey. What do you like? 
horse number two. The four horse. The one horse. I always bet on five. Up yours. Thank you. Richard Dreyfus is Jay Trotter. A man oh. with nothing to lose. You finished with that? Hmm. Knock yourself out, pal. But an uninterrupted losing streak. I don't deserve this anguish. There's a horse in the third race. The man just said that the only way this horse can lose is if lightning strikes. What do you like? You like the odds on lightning? I mean, really, I don't see why you people can't just watch the horses run around the track uh, and not bet on them. Just let me win this one. Honey, some people like to rub me for luck. I'm due. But what's happening to him today? Yeah! My God, Trotter, you won! Is one? I can't believe it! For the books. Congratulations. You might be walking around lucky and not even know it. $2,450. Rich. Give me the money. Because when Jay Trotter wins... What do you like in the third, huh? He takes the world. Seven horse. Yeah! Along for the ride. I'm having a good day. $59,000. Where's all this money? Let it ride. I put every penny on the number two horse, hot and trot. I have a house in the Bahamas, and I've never been with cut. No! The horse is probably going to swallow his tongue or something. He's coming through! You're the greatest I've ever seen. I'll tell my grandchildren about you. Richard Dreyfus. God likes me! He really, really likes me! David Johansson. I can't see him, so it's mine! Terry Gar. It's only money. Jennifer Tilly. This is what life is all about. Fun, Eddie, if you know what I mean. Jackie's high on the horse. He's probably trying to get off. One more word, I'll kill you. Get glued together. I could lose. Come on. Oh, oh, oh. I thought we had a deal. Let it ride. Oh, you're a wonderful guy. <laughs> oh, my God. And it was funny because it, when I posted about it on socials, um, Twitter, Instagram, I was maybe not surprised that I got a lot of responses. Um, well, actually, I posted my whole list, my discoveries list, and it's at the top of my list. But the most responses I got were people saying, let it ride. I love that movie. And I was like, oh, you know, clearly people know about this, and that's great. It, it's, a, it's a small but devoted fan base. Yes. <laughs> And, but uh, now I get it. Now I get it completely. Right. Well, th- I mean, it is a movie that you can post about. I do so quite frequently. And the same four or five people will always chime in with a hell yeah and let it ride. <laughs> and, and everyone else is left bewildered that I'm talking about this just nothing Richard Dreyfus movie from the 80s. It's got, I have a thing. It's got that right. sheen to it, though. It's, it looks like a movie that should be forgotten. Like, if you just look at the box, it's like, I've seen that on the video shelf, and no, I never had a desire to watch it. Yeah, no, it's just, it's this picture of Richard Dreyfus on his knees. You can see a racetrack in the background. There's money falling around him. He's, like, in a prayer stance, basically looking up at the heavens. And, yeah, it just looks kind of pathetic, in a way, <laughs> uh, that cover. And, you know, I don't know. I just, I guess... There, there were, I think, a few, maybe uh, less than stellar Richard Dreyfus comedies. You know, more in the '90s, I would say, than than the '80s. But I think maybe people see this and they get maybe a, a Krippendorf's Tribe vibe. No offense to Krippendorf's Tribe fans, I'm not against that film, but I think <laughs> I remember being maybe really so- excited to see that movie for, for whatever reason. It just <laughs> yeah. came out like at a time I was like, oh yeah, that, I'm ready to see that Richard Dreyfus. I'm in. Sure. Yeah, and uh, what's her name? Jenna Elfman's Jenna in Elfman, that, I yeah. think. Yeah, yeah. That's about all I remember so about I... Krippendorf's tribe at this point. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I think that maybe there's a couple ma- less than great, you know, Dreyfus comedies that I think people might have lumped this in with. Now, I think you're a fan of Moon Over Parador. Yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay, see, now that's the one that I, I don't remember well enough, but I feel like I had a... Uh, a response that was not, in, you know, enthusiastic at the first viewing of that movie, and for some reason I crossed it with this movie as well and blocked both of them off, which is a weird thing to do because it's a totally different kind of movie. <laughs> Moon over Parador. There are some similarities, and now for an actor, good rules are hard to come by. I was a Nubian space slave last week with an aluminum foil junk strap. 
Hey, remember when I played a sperm? And I begged for that part. But Jack Noah is about to get the role of a lifetime. I happen to be a very well-known American actor. Not that well-known. What are you, a critic? I got a part for you to play. This is a real man! It's a role any actor would die for. Play the parts or I'll kill you. When do I start? Meet the new president of Parador. Not like that. With a flip. I'm flipping, I'm flipping. Tell me, Parador. We have a hit. He's a total bloody genius, isn't he? Who are you? I'm an actor. I'm playing the dictator. I can help you play the part of Hitler. He's not the first actor to become president. Hello. This is your dictator speaking. But he may be the last. Wait. Richard Dreyfus. Why didn't you get Bobby De Niro? Or Dustin Hoffman? Raul Julia. Laugh. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> Sonia Braga. You should get an Oscar for tonight. And a cast of thousands. I love you, Sammy. I love you. From the creators and star of Down and Out and Beverly Hills. <laughs> what a psychotic. Moon over Parador. Let's warm up and do some aerobics. And one, and two, and three, and four. Everybody! I Moon over Parador this. was cable on the present. I <laughs> I think it's it's one of those movies that is just lodged in my brain. Certain scenes will never leave. I can remember them almost verbatim because it was just on. Late eighties was 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 the time that I just popped on HBO and I would watch anything that was on and it didn't matter how often I'd seen it. And Moon Over Parador is one of those movies. Like Moon Over Parador, Summer School. I, I can't explain it. And I watched it again for the first time uh la- in like fifteen years last year. Maybe even longer. Uh, it's not as great as I remembered, but there's still a lot to in that Richard Dreyfuss performance in Moon Over Parador, and that's kind of what boosts that movie up a notch versus versus you know Krippendorf's Tribe, which which I you know uh, and, and let <laughs> and let it ride is also boosted by that Richard Dreyfuss performance. But we'll we'll talk about why that's important. I think in a minute. Yes, sir. <clears throat> so, yes, sir. Uh, Let It Ride, nineteen eighty nine, was released by Paramount, uh, August eighteenth. It, it was pretty much buried in the August calendar. Was not given much promotion at all. They didn't think much of it, nor did the critics at the time. Uh, it was based on Good Vibes by Jay Cronley, which is notable because he's written books that would also come Quick Change and Funny Farm. Oh, quick change. Wow, that's yeah. awesome. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, his books are really hard to find. This one in particular, it, it's it's hundreds of dollars used on eBay. Wow. Um, the Good Vibes is just hard to find. I, I, I Every time I go into a used bookstore, I always just take a quick look <laughs> to see if it's um, just stuck there. Now I'm going to make it my mission, too, if I'm ever around to check check for that. And I still haven't read it as a result. By the time I recognized or was old enough to recognize that, hey, this was based on a book that I would, would clearly like to read at this point, it was always hard to find. Oh, that's unfortunate because, yeah, this is definitely – knowing that, I'd love to get the uh, the inner monologue of this movie, you know, because I love, love it as a movie, but clearly – there's a lot more the book could be uh, digging into that I'd be intrigued by. There's a real pulse to the art of gambling in this movie that you don't get elsewhere. And I feel like that's got to come from Cronley's book. Yeah. Yeah, There's this is coming from a place of what I feel like is somebody who knows this world rather intimately and whether that means they are a gambler themselves or were a gambler – uh, I'm not sure, but you know, just the, the, just the little things like the way that the gamblers behave in terms of, um, superstition and when they go to that track bar, I think is one of the moments when I start really to lock into the movie. I mean, I'm locking in before then because I love the Dreyfus and David Johansson characters together. I think those two are great, but the bar is so neat because you've got all these, you know, rogues gallery of gamblers and they all have kind of their own <laughs> idiosyncratic, you know, things going on. You can't think of nothing. Not even women. I'm telling you, two jugs pop up. It'll take you 17 minutes to get rid of them. Numbers, 
going to flash. Four, six, nine. It's going to be moving like the son of a bitch. You've got to keep your eyes open. Now, in sports, where you need teams, letters appear. I see a D. That could be Dallas or Denver. Or Dow Giants. Right. Oh, God. Schwader, what's the matter? I just saw my life flash in front of my eyes. What's it look like? It was going down the drain. Hey, Schrader, do you realize you just had a minor vibe when the five horse sink to swim? Your life is going down the drain, right? Sink, drain, get this connection. Oh, God. That's incredible. Hey, I'm trying to educate you guys. Yeah, I just, I just love seeing that group, though, because there's a ton of familiar faces. There's even a guy uh, from California Split in the bar, and he's, I think he's a dude in the in the opening scene of California Split. But which, by the way, I think would be uh, an interesting double feature with this movie. That'd work. That'd uh, be really nice. Yeah, I think I would start with California Split and end with this because. I just think that would flow a little better. But there's a scene at the beginning of California Split where uh, Elliot Gould is playing cards at this um, gambling place in, in L.A. And there's a guy that's, you know, giving him and George Siegel a hard time. And he's kind of an asshole. And you just remember this guy's face. And he shows up in the bar there. And I just thought that was an interesting connection, too, by the way. The, the, the supporting cast in this is pretty incredible. Yes. I mean, you just go on the list. You mentioned David Johansson already, but the, I mean, Terry Garr plays his wife. Yes. Uh, Robbie Coltrane is maybe gives his finest five minutes of cinema in this movie. He's pretty fantastic in a small amount of time. I have to agree. Uh, Jennifer Tilly in one of her earliest roles, which is wonderful. Gen- I mean, uh. <laughs> uh, Cynthia Nixon, very young. <clears throat> yeah. Michelle Phillips of Mamas and the Papas. <laughs> That's right. But, that was a, uh, an unusual discovery. And then um, uh, Richard Dimitri, uh, Johnny Dangerously fans will recognize him as Roman Maroney. He looks yes. very different in this movie. He does, but you can definitely it's feel there. his vibe. Yeah. And it's a totally different character, obviously. He's nothing like Roman Maroney, but uh. I'm like, ah, you old Fargan Isol, you. It's so good to see you again. Um, I love uh, Richard Edson has a, a yep. small part. He's great. He's and then Mary Warnoff. Mary Warnoff has a small part, and so she gives it a boost, too. It's good and, stuff. And then uh, the writer of this movie is probably would be worth talking about as well. Nancy Dowd, writing under the pseudonym. Oh my God! How Ernest did I not Morton. catch that? Yep, Ernest, she she disowned it and wrote under her one of her one of one of her two pseudonyms. And this time, in this case, Ernest Morton. Oh, interesting. She disowned this movie. Wow, that's not the first time she's disowned a movie. I feel like I no, feel like she she's had disowned... two pseudonyms that she used. She was apparently rather yeah. prickly. Wow, that's too bad because this is, you know, I mean, for fans of her other work, I would say, best. I don't know, I, I like it a lot. So. It's a strong it's strip. A, it's tight. It's a shot. And, uh, yeah. I, mean, I mean, ladies and gentlemen, yeah. family Well, that's unfortunate. And, uh, I mean, she also. Oh, yeah. Uh, Love that film. Love it. Uh, uncredited work on North Dallas 40, Cloak and Dagger, Ordinary People. I mean, she, she had some, some serious credits uh, that weren't even mentioned in her filmography. I love all those movies. I know. <laughs> it's insane that, I mean, she didn't have a, a really long career, but she really, you know, she, she wrote some great movies. Yeah, no, that's crazy I didn't catch that. Um, so I think when we're looking at this movie... And why it didn't catch on, or why it doesn't didn't resonate, it's easy to look to the the contemporaneous critics of 1989, uh, who widely dismissed it. Uh, one of my favorite blurbs, um, just because of the cadence of the review, I'm gonna I'm gonna read here. It's from Rita Kempley in the Washington Post. I'm not familiar with uh, Rita Kempley. Are you? Don't know her. I think that this movie got tossed to a lot of the the B level critics. Uh, so she says, uh, Dreyfus, a real Mr. Sparky Pants, carries the picture, no easy task when burdened with an oafish scene-hogging st- scene sidekick. Welcome support does come from Robbie Coltrane as a lov- lovably cynical ticket seller, and Jennifer Tilly, a ditzy brunette whose bus line is the movie's most remarkable asset. Will her bosom pop like a nuclear souffle from its precarious spandex moorings? Oh well, why beat a dead horse? 
<laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> I I don't know if I've ever read something written quite like that, especially those last couple lines. Um, no. <laughs> but that kind of reflects a lot of the thought about this movie. I don't think it ever had a chance of catching on with anyone. Yeah, no, it's it's really sad to me because having, again, taken so long to see it myself and then being like completely b- floored by how much I loved it, it, it just makes me sad that it's going to be one of those that will be stuck annals of forgotten performances, you know, for forever probably. Yeah, do you remember this movie in, at, in the time? I mean, we, we're about the same age. Do you uh, remember any of the promotion, promotion uh, commercials or ads or anything? I don't think so but i mean i was definitely a richard dreyfus fan at the time i i feel like i mean stakeout is a few years later but that was one that rejuvenated my love for him i i loved him in jaws obviously but then the 80s was like a bit of a you know i was less interested in some of the work he was doing at that time despite it being good tin men's a good movie i mean there's a lot of good stuff there you know i i saw it on VHS. I, I rented this shortly after it came out. Um, I'm not... I, I don't... I, I couldn't remember any of the trailers or ads. Uh, I don't remember playing in theaters despite kind of living at the theater that summer. Uh, it, it's kind of an odd thing that that it just laid there. Um, I did find a positive quote. Unfortunately, it comes from Kevin Thomas, who <clears throat> was called the Will Rogers of film criticism because he <laughs> just liked everything. Oh, no. Yeah. Um, but it it speaks to a lot of what I recognize in the movie. So whether it comes from someone who is widely positive or not, it sounds like he was just a movie lover, and that kind of made him less lesser respected in, in film critic circles. So he says... It really is the kind of movie they don't make anymore on several counts. First of all, it's a Runyon-esque racetrack comedy, a genre one might well have thought past reviving. Second, its humor is gentle and unpretentious. There's no going for hard slam-bang yucks or elaborate set-piece catastrophes requiring a legion of stunt people. Believe it or not, the abundant humor in the sterling screenplay Ernest Morton adapted from Jay Cronley's Good Vibes actually derives from the foibles of human nature and not from special effects. It's worth mentioning... um, that Runyon-esque, for those that aren't familiar, is a um, uh, type of character or situation or dialogue um, written by Damon Runyon. He spun humorous and sentimental stories about gamblers, hustlers, gangsters, anybody who was sort of left a, of you know genteel society. Um, they they went by you know, names like. Nathan Detroit and Benny South Street, Harry the Horse. <laughs> it's it's a mixture of formal speech and slang, um, and that's what the how Runyon S comes into play. Uh, and it's something I didn't think about until going through these reviews. And it, and it totally is just a totally throwback style of filmmaking. There's nothing. The some of the characters are over the top, but what happens in the movie never. It goes beyond this. It never goes beyond this sort of mid-level anxiety that just keeps increasing as the story goes on, as his winnings build and build. Yeah, no, that's definitely one of the the hooks of gambling movies. They're much like heist movies in that respect, in that there is often an inherent tension, and you just, I think, you're drawn to that tension. But it can also put people off, I think, especially gambling movies, because they can be so devastating when you see somebody lose everything. That's what, um, what most of them are. I think that's what this yeah. movie is special. Yeah, no, it's 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 a tricky thing, the gambling movies. I am really drawn to them, but I often find there are, are a couple in particular that I can't come back to that often because of that tension is just too much for me, <laughs> you know? They have a lot in common with uh, movies about alcoholism too. Yep. That they're absolutely they can be occasionally brilliant, but you know, like Long Weekend, that's certainly not something I go back to. No, I've seen it twice, maybe. Yeah, I think I've seen it once, and I yeah. remember really enjoying it. But well, I think I I prefer to watch it through the lens of Dead Men Don't Wear Plaid. Yeah. <laughs> myself now. <laughs> that's my favorite. 
I mean, we can talk about the plot a little bit. The plot's not 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 too too difficult to dispose of in within a, a minute or two here. So Richard Dreyfus plays Jay Trotter. Uh, he's a cab driver. He's also a gambling addict with a rocky marriage. His wife. Uh, the this, the movie opens with uh, he and his wife at a Chinese restaurant. They're sort of renewing their pledges to each other about how they're going to be better people. And then they um, sort of, you know, they, they, they make amends and promise to have a, a recoupling the next day. <laughs> but then they get into the fortune cookies. <laughs> Great bit. I love that bit. Sometimes you can be walking around lucky and not know it. Excuse me? The fortune. That's what it says. Oh. That's what the fortune says. Oh, it okay. says, uh, yeah, it says sometimes you can be walking around lucky and not know it. Oh. Well, you know what mine says? Stand by your man. Fabulous. I think I'll save that. Take another one. Here, take that one. No, no, I'll take the other one. You ruin that one. I'll take this one over here. How did I ruin it? I just... Well, you touched it. See, when well, you touch I, it, it's not my fault. I didn't open it. I just I know you didn't it. open it, but you touched it, and when you touch well, so it, it what? changes the fortune. So what? This is the one it means that's pointing that it's to you. Your... It doesn't mean... How do you know it's... what it means? Hey, 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 hey. There are rules. Just follow the rules. rules. What are these? Are the international rules of fortune cookie yes, taking? They are. Yes, I, they would you are. want Please... me to lose my temper? Excuse me. Take this excuse me. No, excuse, excuse me. <laughs> Sorry. Would you mind telling my wife what happens when you touch another person's cookie? It's no good anymore. See? Who the hell is this guy? I never heard that. What? You see, you have to open the cookie. That's not true. Oh, yeah, then it's your fortune. No, no, no. You got to open it. What are you, an authority? Shut up and eat your dinner. Cookie. No, you got to eat it. If you don't eat it, it doesn't count. No, 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 you can't. It's only a cookie. I'm kind of on his side. I know, me too. (laughs) Because, I mean, there has to be some rules. Otherwise, you know, anybody could pick up anything and touch anything and it would... It's. It has to be. There has to be some moment of contact that makes the fortune significant. I believe in that. Right. There has to be. There has to be some cosmic limitations on the ability of a fortune to read the person that's opening it. it at, yes. At, at worst, it confuses it. I mean, at best, it confuses the fortune. I mean, what? Yeah. I have this argument all the time with fortune cookies, and I, I pretty much use that dialogue <laughs> verbatim. <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay. So that night. Uh, his friend Looney, the David Johansson, Johansson character, is also a cab driver, and he comes to him with a with a recording of people from his cab talking about how they have a sure thing horse and that they should bet big. So, despite making this promise to his wife, Jay Trotter takes his hundred dollars to the track to bet on charity. <laughs> the four horse because he doesn't see it as gambling. He sees it as it's not a business opportunity. It's a business because if you know if you know the outcome, it's not gambling. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and this sets in motion the the day the the very good day where Jay Trotter can't lose. He takes the tape back to the gamblers or the the guys who'd fix the fix the race and they think he's about to blackmail them and, and get very angry and very upset but when they realize he's just giving them the tape back they give him a tip on the next race so he bets it all and wins again i mean i will say for the for me because of my history with gambling movies i kept waiting for the loss mm-hmm. and so i think that's part of the reason the movie's so uplifting is then when it you know it doesn't happen it's like wow okay great <laughs> i've never seen a gambling movie like this it, it is right it is an optimistic gambling movie but it, i can't it, think of another one no can you think of it i i yeah, tried okay. for this podcast i sat down and went through all of the gambling movies i could think of and none of them everybody loses yeah i mean there, there's there's moral victories but that's not what we're dealing with here yeah. Yeah. No, it's a beautiful thing. This this movie. I I I don't know. I and then once you know what's the outcome, then the movie just becomes a celebration. You know, it's just like I don't know. It is, and it's it's something I turn to. There there, and we all these these couple movies or handful of movies that we go to just when we want to put something on because we need a, a pick me up. This is one of three movies, maybe, that I go to. It never disappoints me. It's 87 minutes long. Oh, yeah. (laughs) And it's just full of joy. Every time 
every time he goes to the ticket window with it's not even the last scene the the scene where he buys 48 50 dollar win tickets 48 50 dollar win tickets on the three horse in the seventh race yeah. how much does 48 50 dollar win tickets on the three horse in the seventh race mm. 48 50 dollar win tickets on the three horse in the seventh race at Hmm. 25 to 1 will pay you approximately $69,000. This is a lot of money. Yeah, their relationship as the movie goes, it definitely becomes one of my favorite things. Just the way that they talk to each other is so wonderful. It starts out combative because at first he's like, you know, the the $5 window is over there. (laughs) It's like, just shut up and place the bet. Yeah, and then Coltrane becomes invested in the guy, kind right. of, and it's like, you know, <laughs> it's really interesting. Yeah, so the the scene I'm talking about, he, it's later in the movie. It's not the final race. Um, he's just pulled all of these people at the track to see what their favorite horse was on the next race, and he scratches off horses <laughs> based on what they say because he is not going to pick what the losers pick. Yep. So when he finally has the last horse, he goes back to the window, puts down $2,400 on the horse that, that no one picked. So he and he puts down the money, and he and Coltrane share a cigarette as they wait for the <laughs> 48 tickets to print out. And uh, Coltrane goes on this monologue. It, it's, just, it's beautiful. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. I do this for a living. I've been doing it for 15 years. Played the circuit. One track closes, another one opens. Some big places, some of them dumps, and I've met all kinds of characters. But believe me, pal, you're the champ. I really <laughs> hope you win. You're the greatest I've ever seen. I'll tell my grandchildren about you. It's such a great moment. <laughs> but it's just, there's just scene after scene where, it, even though I know, you know, I know exactly what's going to happen, it just makes me smile. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, and then you have like you have the different locations. You have, like I said, you have the the uh racetrack bar that becomes a thing and that's sort of the the loser hangout a little bit and then later dreyfus you know goes to the the club uh the upscale club at the track and that's like its own like french plantation you know kind of you know bizarre world of upper class twits nice to meet both of you Mm. thank you likewise what do you want in the fifth? Who do you like in the fifth? Hmm? Bernie lost his ass already today. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Zip it. Hey, you want to know my philosophy? Mm-hmm. Nobody knows you got money. What the hell's the use of having it? I got a condo. The thing is worth 700% more than I paid for. It. I don't need a place that big, huh? Do I need that? Mm-mm. But I like space. Space. He likes space. Guess how many bathrooms it has. I don't know. That's how many it has. He found six. Six bathrooms. Oh, I got to get even. I got to get even. I'm in a bit of grand this time. Excuse me. She, uh, she's got... Very long legs. That's right. They go from my ass all the way to the floor. My legs. And um, <laughs> that's even as as entertaining as the other place. So I just love those two locations and the different characters you see in both of them. I would never have thought you could make a movie that takes place almost entirely at a racetrack as interesting and varied as this movie does, you know? Yeah, and it's it's one day. It's mostly self-contained. There's a couple scenes outside the racetrack, but they're they're barely there. He goes back to see his wife, and I said it yeah. opens at the Chinese restaurant. But once he gets to the track, it's there. Yeah, and, and it's just going from 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 the track to the club or the bar, <laughs> and back to the track again. Yeah, I just man. But yeah, like that dialogue and in the characters, it's just really like you said, throwback style. You know, almost, um, you know, could be a 
30s movie or something, you know? It's there's something about it. It has so that, timeless. that cadence and dialogue uh that that's it's quippy but not jokey. Uh Yeah. And when it does, you know, it tosses out a few few of those cornball jokes like there's a um Cynthia Nixon has terrible braces on her, uh, and somebody makes a quip about who did your orthodontics, Ray Charles. But it's like an aside; <laughs> it's barely there, and the, the the movie just keeps on right, keeps on going. Yeah, um, and I love that the movie offers a nice platform for Dreyfus in terms of he has this ability to be manic. Uh, and I would say Michael Keaton has a similar ability in comedy to, to, you know, do extreme highs and lows, big energy, big moments. I can't believe I didn't pick that! What wonderful people! I'd hate to have to walk around this joint with $700 cash. 710 And you'll never have that problem! Because the only reason I won is that you didn't bet! You are the unluckiest person in the world! Am not! Am! Am not! Am! Who do you like in a second? The six horse looks pretty good. Huh? You got a brother? In Cleveland? Call him up! Ask him who he likes! I figure it's in the blood! I mean, Dreyfus is an actor's actor anyway, but but yeah, this is this movie just allows for him to just get really big and not feel out of place. I don't know, it just works to his strong suits. It does. Really. It, the his his performance here is like you said it reaches these he has moments of euphoria and 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 moments of just when he he thinks he loses and it goes back and forth. And the performance hits these super highs and super lows, but it mostly just maintains this steady presence. It's impossible to value what he brings to a movie that nobody really appreciates in the first place. <laughs> He's got a few of those, too. I mean, I was thinking about The Big Fix, which is yes. really on his shoulders, it's another really steady sort of low-key. certainly doesn't hit the, the manic eyes that he has here, but it's of the same vein. Yeah, and another of my favorites. In fact, another great double bill with this movie, interestingly, I think. Yeah. Uh, Dreyfus double with that. Yeah, that movie I absolutely adore, and I put it up there with some of the best, you know, 70s detective movies, The Long Goodbyes. Of the, of the seventies, I think it's it's in that category for me. I think he's really great in it. So, what is it about Richard Dreyfus <laughs> in in this movie in The Big Fix? Why do these movies get get brushed aside? It's almost like they get forgotten as soon as they're released. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. That's bizarre to me because Dreyfus, you know, makes a strong opening appearance. Well, not opening. Obviously, he had work before Jaws, but he's in one of the most successful films ever, and he's fantastic in it. And then he's in another. You see Close Encounters. Um, And then, yeah, I don't know what happens with these comedies. I'm not sure why they are less valued, because I think he is always um, bringing comedy to all his roles. You know, he's funny in Jaws. He's funny in Close Encounters. It's it's the it's truly like must be his personality or something because it comes through in most of the roles I love most for him. I, I don't I don't even know what it is. I mean, I I, I watch this and and you know I'm, I, I I love Stakeout, but maybe it's because it's it, these other movies aren't as broad. I mean, Stakeout's a, a much broader film than either of the the two that we're mentioning here. True. But I do love Stakeout too, personally. Yeah, so do I. Uh, it's just a different, different kind of Dreyfus, and and he does have this. Maybe it's because he he comes off as the smartest person in the room. Like, is that sort of off putting? Yeah, that might be it. That could be something. I, I'm you not know? guessing here. I don't actually have any answers. <laughs> I know Dude, I find it, I find it really funny too, though. By the way, that Stakeout, a gigantic hit. Um, not on Blu-ray, not talked about really as much right now. I find that pretty shocking considering... Yeah, Stickout's 87. How, two years before this, and again, a huge hit. Like I, I remember it being such a big deal when it came out, and now you know, you, people don't talk about that movie much. And I think the availability certainly hurts it. I mean, that, may, that movie made 
close to seventy million dollars as a comedy, Damn. as an yeah. R-rated comedy in nineteen eighty-seven. That's huge. It's such a big deal. And it's a shame that that it's not talked about. You mentioned yeah, you brought up J- Michael Keaton too. I think that's a good comparison. And a lot of his comedies, or a lot of his movies from from the eighties. I mean, Prime Keaton era doesn't. They don't really. They're not really supported. You don't see them on on Blu-ray either. No. Where is Night Shift? For God's sake, oh, ridiculous! No. Come on. If I can take a moment here, uh, and I mean this, what I'm about to say, I feel a lot of love in this room. I don't know, maybe it's me, but I'll tell you something, I was here a minute ago, and uh, it was really beautiful. So at this moment, I think it's important that I see all of your breasts. Or I don't have to, I don't see the breasts. I mean, we did just, just get the squeeze, so we're supposed to, I think we're supposed to be happy with that. Yeah, well. Have you seen the squeeze? It's been a long time. <laughs> I've seen it, but I'll be damned if I can remember it. Um, I just I mean, remember it, Ray Don it, Chong in it, that's, that's it. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I think i have blocked by the dream team for some reason which i feel like was around the same time too and i do like him in that very manic yeah that's another dream team is another 1989 movie and uh, oh that's right oh my god (laughs) that's so funny you could have seen let it ride and dream team you know within weeks of each other perhaps dream Dream team uh came out april i believe okay but yeah i like i love that manic energy i feel like it's Robin Williams gets a lot of credit for that sort of, I mean, it's not an approach. It's more, well, I mean, I guess it's an approach, but it's, it seems again, almost inherently part of an actor's personality, the ability to be able to sort of, you know, go to those manic stratospheres uh, and have that energy. And yeah, Dreyfus and, and Keaton are two of my favorites that have it. And kind of working concurrently as well. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, well, it was a and wonderful didn't, time. Didn't they never really did a movie together that I can I don't, think of? I don't think so. That is a shame. That would have been something. I'll that tell you. That would have been interesting. Wow. Maybe too much. Maybe too much for one movie. I don't know, but <laughs> but still pretty cool it, it, to think. It's about. either the worst thing we never got, or it saved the universe. <laughs> exactly. I was a. Uh, Going back to a point you made about the the how the movie feels like an insider ticket to some sort of horse racing culture, uh, yeah. I, I read a, a a pretty lengthy blog uh, blog post on what seems to be now I don't know much of anything about horse racing besides I I've, I've partaken in the activity a few times, but in terms of this hardcore dynamic, I'm, I'm totally lost. But so I read an article on America's best racing, which, which looks to be a pretty substantial horse racing blog based on the appearance. Uh, there was an article from 2014 about let it ride. Uh, so this is this is what what they said. Let it ride is the greatest horse racing movie ever made. Not because it is funny, although it certainly has its moments, and not because it is dramatic, although there are scenes that so perfectly capture the tension and drama of sweating a big wager you'd think it was documentary. It's because Let It Ride is perhaps the only horse racing movie ever made that looks to capture the point of view of the punter, the handicapper, the horse race gambler. It's not so much a story about horses or even racing as it is a story about betting on horse races. And for the vast majority of fans of the sport, that's how we experience it. Yeah. Absolutely. They go they go as far as to compare Richard Dreyfus's character to uh a Cary Grant for horse racers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sure. I'm, I'm yeah. not so I'm not exactly sure how that how that works, but I, I like, yeah, I, I, like that was, to... I like that it was in there. Yeah. I mean, it's it, you know, it's 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 a performance for the ages and it's it, it the comic notes are near to perfect so on that level um yeah carrie grantish but i i don't fully follow that line of logic doesn't matter it's it's compliment and i'll take it it, it is a com- i think it's more more about the the way that he inhabits the space and and the way he interacts with the other characters and I, in that respect i can see i can see some of that but this is definitely not a carrie grant character <laughs> no <laughs> No, but yeah, I it's it's one of his best. It is always sad to me when you you have that moment of complete elation uh, at discovering quote unquote a movie 
from an actor that you know well and that you enjoy and you see it and you go, this is this at one of this actor's greatest performances. And then you realize, but there's no way that it's ever going to be known on the level of, you know, his most popular work. And that's unfortunate, you know, and I'm not being pessimistic or, or cynical about it. It's just a, it's a brief moment of sadness before I return to my own elation of like, well, but I've seen it and I love it and I'll tell everybody I know about it till the end of my days. So there's that. And I think that people love this movie do, do, do the same thing. I think there, there is a, a certain lament that we're never going to be able to share the joy that we feel about this movie with others. But maybe that's okay. Maybe it yeah. is just ours. And I think about that a lot when I'm thinking about some of these uh, cult movies or movies that never find their audience or have found a very small vocal audience. Maybe it is just ours. Yeah. No, that's definitely, there's a thing to that. There's a thing to the ownership one takes of a movie like this and and the feeling that you get of uh, if... It's not a, it's not so self-aggrandizing as to be like if I stop talking about this movie it will go away. It's not like that, but it is sort of a sense of like I am in some way continuing this movie's legacy by talking about it because I love it. And th- it's on me to continue to do that or not, but I will do that because I love it. I, yeah, so there's an ownership cycle in there somewhere that's interesting. I think about it uh, in terms of, of Let It Ride and Joe versus the Volcano. Oh, yeah. In terms of, especially with Joe versus Volcano, which has just seeped into my pores. I, I, <laughs> I have watched it and, and cherished it so much. So that's one of the other of the three you mentioned, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so when... I, I, I did some writing about Joe versus the volcano uh, last year, and I, I wanted to continue and, and flesh out more of of what it made me feel because it's a very unique movie, and it, in many ways it, it shares a lot with with Let It Ride. But I, I did come to the conclusion that maybe the reception that that it got, which you know, the dismissed and maligned for decades before a, a small reappraisal contributes to the way I feel about it as well. Yeah, I can see that. So maybe the best thing that ever happened to Joe versus the volcano was not getting that immediate acceptance in 1990. And maybe the best thing for let it ride was that it was just ignored. And there, it has a, a fan base now, uh, that truly appreciates it and champions it more because, uh, it was ignored. Yeah, I can't say that that's not a factor for me. It definitely is in some cases where I feel like, you know, as I go on, I feel like certain movies, you get a sense of your like, it's almost like walking into a room that is the fan base of the movie and hearing the sort of roar of the crowd and being like, okay, this movie has what it needs and then just letting that be and then going into the room that would be let it ride and there's maybe a scattered few (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, you They're know, probably it's, drunk and sitting. It's like it's like the bar scene and, and exactly. inside Let It Ride. Actually, it is. Uh, it's a weird metaphor, but but <laughs> you know, there's just something to that idea of like this movie has what it needs. This movie doesn't, and I am drawn to this one. It's just an underdog thing, you know. Yeah. It always will be that. Yeah. So, and it, I think it's worth mentioning too that it's it's never going to get. It never had a chance of of finding a broader audience. It it is a it's a niche uh, focus uh, horse racing so people are automatically turned off by the gambling or the horse racing and and some people will just never be able to warm to it because of the focus um i mean there's there's a, there's a few barriers and like you said the perception and people just aren't going to give it give it the chance unlike you who are open-minded and, and ready to take that plunge because richard dreyfus and everything else is is perfect and why not watch it yeah, I'm finally enlightened. <clears throat> thank God. So I think we the best we can do is just, like you said, just keep trying to make that crowd a little bit bigger. Yeah, yeah, no, and I, I definitely will. And boy, I wish that Paramount. We'll I wish I could be more together. Op- <laughs> <laughs> exactly, very much. I, I'm, I'm sad 
that you know whenever I see uh, discover a new movie in the um, Paramount canon these days that isn't on Blu-ray, I am suddenly like, well, shit, this is probably it's not going to happen. Never going to happen. Yeah, because they're just going to release the same things they've always have. It's sad they can't even do. They can't even bo- be bothered with an MOD no. version of you know what I mean, which is not great at all. But I guess I'll take it. You know. Um, but yeah, that's not even happening with them. So I'm just like, come on guys. Yeah, I think this, this isn't hard to find, but it is out of print. Yeah. And there's I mean, th- certainly no Blu-ray on the horizon. No, I mean, thankfully there is an HD version you can get on Amazon. Mm-hmm. So that's something it's relatively accessible there. And I have that, but yeah, I'd love to get, I'd love to get a commentary. I mean, if Joe Pitka would ever talk about it, um, it's nobody seems to want to talk about it. The principals don't talk about it. Pitka, I've never seen anything from him. Uh, the yeah. only person I've seen is is Jay Cronley, who wrote about it with some minor dismay. He doesn't seem to care for it a whole lot. Huh. I mean, did we talk about Joe Pitka? By the way, we, we haven't gotten there yet. I, I was, I was, that was next on the list, and that he okay. is sort of a. He's a fascinating character when you when you look up back on him because I I was vaguely aware uh, of that he had done other stuff and I use other stuff loosely but he's directed two movies uh, Let It Ride and Space Jam. <laughs> <laughs> and when you, I'm a Space Jam apologist, by the way. Uh, I it, it hit us at the right time. I, I yeah. enjoy it. Uh, I, yeah. I I don't know if you're outside. Like if you were a little bit older or coming to it now as an adult, whether you'd have the same affection for it, if, if, but we planted those seeds early. When the world's greatest athlete, Michael Jordan, teams up with the world's best loved cartoon character, Bugs Bunny, you won't believe your eyes. Pardon me, Mr. Jordan. Can I have your auto uh, your John Hancock? What's going on here? Yeah, I was surprised that my daughter responded to it. Well, I mean, I guess not. I mean, it's a children's movie at the end of the day. But um, my daughter really got into it for a number of years and i actually had to hide the blu-ray at a certain point because i just <laughs> i i like the movie but there was a point where i was like i don't want to watch it again this week you know that kind of thing yeah um but but no i do think it's intriguing that this guy who directed space jam also directed one ostensibly what is now one of my favorite underrated comedies of the 1980s i think that's intriguing as hell it is. Let's 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 talk about Joe Pitka because Joe Pitka never gets talked about, and and this will be the podcast never. that happens, right? Uh, <laughs> exactly. So Joe Pitka is actually from Pittsburgh, which I which I just learned uh, in my quick research. Well, he studied fine arts at Carnegie Mellon and chemical engineering at the University of Pittsburgh. So he's a bit of a smarty pants. Uh, well, he after he graduated, he made documentaries at QED, the flagship center for PBS production, and, and the home of Mister Rogers, obviously. Um. He left uh, PBS to form a production company with a TV writer named Riff Fournier. Uh, They made a series of documentaries, commercials, and shorts. Uh, He got hooked up with Steve McQueen because apparently they shared some passion for motorcycle racing. And together Hmm. they tried to make a documentary feature on off-road desert racing. Which never never reached a conclusion. Uh, the result was a was a short film that also featured McQueen in it. He but he's best known for directing commercials and music videos. And trust me when I say that you've seen Joe Pitka's work. <laughs> he uh, he's directed over eighty Super Bowl commercials. <laughs> Uh, he's won the USA Today, USA Today Super Bowl ad poll seven times. So they have apparently the week, the day following the Super Bowl, they, the USA Today has a poll and, and people vote on the number one Super Bowl commercial. I didn't know that was a thing, but he's won it seven times. Damn. Um, the uh, I don't remember this commercial. I didn't, I didn't look it up, but there is a security camera Pepsi commercial. That was chosen as the best Super Bowl commercial in history. Really? <laughs> wow. Um, and it was, of course, the commercial Hair Jordan, 
that <laughs> became Space Jam. Okay, there we go. So he directed Hair Jordan and then got the job doing Space Jam. But he's worked with Tiger Woods, obviously Michael Jordan. Um, he uh, holds the record number of DGA nominations for Outstanding Directing and Commercials. Wow. He uh, directed Michael Jackson's The Way You Make Me Feel and Dirty Diana videos in 87 and 89, which led directly, obviously, to Let It Ride. Yeah. That's intriguing to me, that history, you know? It's like, oh, wait a minute. He's apparently a really big deal. (laughs) Yeah. Just not for movies. It's funny when you find these things out, digging into the stuff that you feel like you should have known by now. (laughs) Well, yeah. Um, but no, I do find it intriguing too. When you look at a director and you go, what, just two movies, what, what has he done? What's happened? And then you look and you, Oh, he did a ton of commercials and music videos and, and that's a really great living. So it's kind of, I'm sure fine to not make movies, <laughs> you know, he's, after he's probably doing all right. <sighs> yeah. Well, and then of course, space jam is like a movie jail kind of movie in terms of directing and he may or may not maybe want to direct another movie. He, he comes out with a great gambling movie. It gets panned or just ignored. He does space jam. And you know, that movie was a mess in terms of its reception. Um, but it was so, popular at the time. Was it? I oh remember, yeah. I remember, like I remember it. Well, I mean, I mean, my perception is warped because I think literally everyone I know went to see that movie. <laughs> Yeah, no, it could be that. I just, I think it feels like the butt of a joke kind of movie. Not in a way that I agree with that, uh, you know, assumption. But, um, but yeah, it's it's definitely one that doesn't necessarily, I think, in Hollywood make you go, we want to do that guy's next movie, um, which is sad. I don't like I don't like the idea that that's how Hollywood operates necessarily. But you know, it's it's always going to be that sort of. Uh, high school popularity contest mentality in some sense, you know? Yeah, it's what have you done lately. And, uh, exactly. If your last movie is Space Jam. But I think you hit it on the head when you said, I don't think he wants to work in movies. Yeah. Why bother? Why would he? Exactly, <laughs> I, exactly. get, I get nominated for a director's guild, award, guild for commercials by getting out of bed in the morning, and I make these two movies that everyone just makes fun of now. Waiter! More champagne. We're very busy now, sir. That's for all you stuffy rat bastards. Yeah, and how long does it take? Yeah, well, yeah. And how long does it take to shoot a video or shorts? I mean, you know, you can do a bunch in a year and not burn yourself out and not get noted to death probably i mean who knows depending on the client but that's kind of like not to bring back joe versus the volcano but why not yeah Uh, so you've got john patrick shanley who writes this amazing uh script gets wins the award for moonstruck is given carte blanche to make whatever movie he makes he makes joe versus the volcano it gets panned he's like "Ah, i'm gonna bugger off now like i don't want to do this anymore yeah, and then, no, he's not, I mean, and then he doesn't direct anything until Doubt. Oh, is that right? I, yeah. For some reason, I thought he had done something in between. Wow, that's crazy. He doesn't. Wow. Come, he doesn't come back until he does his own. Until he does Doubt, which she wrote. Yeah. Well, and that movie was well received, so it's kind mm-hmm. of interesting. And then he goes away again. Yeah, that he went away. You know, but and now he knows? just posts good morning and good night tweets. Is that? <laughs> Basically. Okay, I gotta follow him for those, <laughs> so I can retweet. Nice, yeah. But um, but yeah, no, it is intriguing to compare "Let It Ride" and "Joe versus the Volcano." I totally see. They they both have this really great quirkiness to them, and I mean quirky, not in the sense that some people use it as almost a. Derogatory. Uh, I meet it in the most charismatic, the most wonderful way, and I love it. You know that a big studio film, especially like Joe vs. the Volcano, could get made. And I love when I, it's one of my favorite things when somebody gets that golden ticket and cashes it in and does something. It blows it know. up. It's like I'm going to yeah. do exactly what I want. Yeah. And whatever happens is fine with me. 
It doesn't and happen very often. It certainly doesn't happen anymore. No, and it, and and those movies tend to be pretty interesting and polarizing. I would think Cabin Boy is sort of another example of that. Yeah. I mean, that's an even more bizarre situation because you have, you know, Adam Resnick and and uh, Chris. Uh, why can't I think of his last name right now? Elliot. From, yeah, Chris Elliot. Excuse me. Um, you know, pitching a story to Tim Burton, him being hot from Batman and Batman Returns, him basically getting him through the process of the, the studio system without any notes at all on this bizarre script that they've come up with that they want to, to pitch to him to, to cater to his favorite things, you know, Harryhausen and <laughs> Captain's Courageous, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. But so then he bails on the movie and leaves them to direct it. And they are then they're also left alone because Tim Burton is insulating them. And I think that's another movie like Joe versus the volcano that is completely unique and is one that a lot of people love, but some people hate <laughs> and uh, or don't don't bother with. Yeah, there, there's but a lot of that. The, it's just it was that dumb movie that Tom Hanks made. That, that. Yeah, which I just it's whatever. I mean, like to me, those are the mo- some of the most interesting movies, and they will stand the test of time. They will be remembered, whereas you know so much of what Hollywood puts out is the most disposable. And I don't mean again that way to be sounding so down on it because i like that stuff you know i just saw jumanji the next level with my daughter and uh it, it was fine it was fun um I mean, there's there's, but, there's always room for that and, and i agree i think it's just recognizing its place yeah but i i do think we could do a little bit more to champion the really interesting stuff and i think social media on some level has helped that you know so yeah that's cool, but but yeah, I, I the the interesting ones that you see and you go, that's something, that we're going to be talking about, or me and you know three other people are going to be talking about for the next ten years. You know those those movies are great. Well, so you you meet someone that that says they love Cabin Boy or Let It Ride, and you know, you you automatically know you have a connection. It's like this guy's all right. Yeah, totally. It really is that kind of a handshake kind of thing. You know, secret handshake. And that's what your, I mean, that's what your website has done so well for so many years, is, is given people the opportunity and the platform to to champion these movies that nobody's talking about. Well, that's one of my favorite things, and I'm I'm so glad the website has developed in that way over the years, because it's been great for me to find a lot of those movies that I haven't seen yet that uh, I want to be part of that conversation. I want to be in the clubhouse, in the track bar, talking about it. You know. <laughs> So it's fun. I think that's that's great. That uh, was a, a good conversation. I think we can close. I mentioned that I had had a <clears throat> some. I'm sorry. I'm clearing my throat again. I am diseased. I'm sorry for everyone else. No, has to, has to listen to me <laughs> fight the frog that's stuck in my throat. Um, but I have a I have a, a piece of, that Jay Cronley wrote about Let It Ride, and you can see where he's. This is just a selection of what the whole thing was. It's mostly about. Um, racetrack and gambling but he does talk touch on the movie itself so he says the screenplay was written by a woman named nancy dowd who i met once and who did not give the impression of knowing which end of a horse went around the track first but one of the requirements of adapting a book to the screen is being skillful with scissors and glue cutting and pasting is as important as background knowledge so this book of mine was adapted by somebody who had seldom been to the track and was directed by a man who had done pop commercials it's all luck said, the movie was made at High Lay in Miami, and I went there for a couple of days. I'm going to report to you that Richard Dreyfuss is a very pleasant person, though the kind who would probably cover his correct answers during an exam at high school. <laughs> <laughs> he also mentions that they went to a dog track to prepare for the movie the day before filming, and um, they got brought to the one of the luxury boxes, like the the box and let it ride and there was a guy who kept walking up and giving whispering tips in richard dreyfus's ear and richard <laughs> dreyfus would quietly get up and go place a bet without telling anyone else <laughs> and he, <laughs> you can you can see that that cromley was a little, had a little bit of a chip on his shoulder that that dreyfus never shared his tips which is such a <laughs> perfect little footnote on this movie that is great it- uh, the last That's thing he, he says here 
there is a tendency to think that the movies greatly exaggerate the assets of the stars, making little guys seem taller and grannies seem more youthful. But Jennifer Tilly's legs were all they are advertised to be, perfectly tapered and confident. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That's nice. But yeah, I thought I thought that was a, a wonderful companion to the movie itself since we actually have very little extra information you know we're doing uh, on the cinema shame program i have been blessed with the wealth of information about the movies that we've talked about like when i was doing research for the last lawrence of arabia episode i think i must have had i must have done 10 to 12 hours of reading and research i mean there's just so much written about movies like that you have yeah. memoirs and uh, documentaries and everybody, every major critic has written a piece on the importance of Lawrence of Arabia. And I go to look for stuff on let it ride. And I have racetrack blogs and <laughs> some <laughs> random thing that Jay Cronley wrote 10 years ago. Um, the best thing on the, there, there is a featurette on the DVD, but it, it is exactly what you, the kind of featurette you'd expect out of a Paramount, 1980s release yeah super short i i noticed that was on there and i was like oh i hadn't watched this yet and then i was like oh it's fucking it's, fluffy it's, bullshit it's useless <laughs> it's too bad um the last the last interesting piece of information since i have covered the entirety of my research is that they they staged those races just for the filming of the movie oh interesting so and the insurance on the racehorses, they w- it wouldn't work. So the production had to buy all of oh, the no. horses that ran and let it ride. Oh, my God. Wow. That's insane. <laughs> and then after they were filming, they were sold back to the original owners. Oh, wow. I wonder how those negotiations went down. I would love to oh. have more information. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> Jeez. And you think about this movie, like this, the length that they needed to go to film <laughs> these horse racing scenes. It's, it's, it's remarkable. And then the crowd scenes, those aren't CGI people. I mean, they filled the stands for these fake races with the horses that they bought. Wow. That's crazy. Because I totally would have thought it was, you know, a, a mix of, you know, uh, real crowds and real races. And that's Stock insane. footage, yeah. I, you yeah. Just, you just yeah. have to assume because why would they go to those lengths? But. But they you would never see they no. bought horses for them. <laughs> that's insane for for this little comedy that they then buried the the budget was eighteen million dollars mm. which is not huge, but what did what were the expenses apparently the horses yeah, I was gonna say what millions of t- <laughs> no I'm just kidding I don't know how much horses <laughs> cost, but you know definitely a significant chunk I would think to something and the movie made five million dollars in the box office oh. it's pissed it all away! that year in particular now i haven't watched 70 movies from 1988 to compare it directly but there's a t- <laughs> there's a ton of these smaller genre movies that just i i slip through like I, the the one that you know you're talking about this is probably your favorite discovery and, and mine I was also uh, 1989, uh, The Mighty Quinn, which I'd never seen oh, until this. Very good movie. Yeah, I'm into that for sure. And I was I was shocked that I hadn't somehow been told to watch it or had come across it. And it's such a wonderful little spy, I mean, it's spy, but detective movie with Denzel Washington. And but yeah, the, there's, and that's on blue. That's on Blu-ray at least. I mean, not bare bones Blu-ray. Let it. But it exists. Yeah. And I had to go buy a copy as soon as I rented it. I watched it. I, yeah. got, I got it from Netflix. I'm like, well, I need to own this now. Yeah. No, it's and Emma at Walsh. I'm just looking at this yeah. this cast. Mimi Rogers. Um Yeah, there's there's definitely a bunch of recognizable faces in it. No, that's a really good yeah, talk about under the radar, the Mighty Quinn for sure. It's it's got a it's got a really interesting story and it, and it's like I said, it's paced unlike any other detective movie I've ever seen. Now I got to go rewatch it. It's been a while. That, I mean, the movie just kind of goes from from point eight. I mean, there is a there is a tension. There's a constant tension, but Denzel is so laid back and so reserved in this role. 
There's there's your bonus pick for the Let It Ride episode. Is <laughs> nice. Talk about eighty nine. I like it. All right, I, that's uh, I think that that's a good job. We we did good things here. We we mentioned a bunch of movies people need to watch from from Richard Dreyfuss and of the era. We're cool. doing the, we're doing the work. Yes. Why don't you at least give me some of the money, and you can keep ten bucks if you have to bet. I mean, really, I don't see why you people can't just watch the horses run around the track uh, and not bet on them. <laughs> She's new. <laughs> <laughs> so damn funny. Because there is no racing without betting. That's poetic. I got the horse right here, the name is Paul Revere, and here's a guy that says if the weather's clear, can do, can do. This guy says the horse can do, if he says the horse can do, can do, can do. I'm picking Valentine, cause on the morning line, the guy has got him bigger than five to nine. But make it epitaph, he wins it by a half. But can do this here in the telegraph? For Paul Rivera, bite, I hear his foot's all right. Of course, it all depends if it's red last night. I know it's Valentine, the morning works look fine. You know the jockey's brother's a friend of mine. And just a minute, boys, I got the feed box noise. It says the great grandfather was egg. I told you, Paul Revere. Now, this is no bum steer. It's from a handicapper that's real sincere. I think it's Valentine, because on the morning line, the guy has got him bigger than five to nine. So make it if it's him. He wins by a half. But talk to this here in the telegraph. Epitaph. Paul Revere. I got the horse. Right. You have chosen wisely.